Okay. So now once we got the fluids kind of settled and we've got the total body surface area and we know exactly what we're doing for that, then comes the rest of it, which is part three. The wound care, the pain management, the hypermetabolic response, sepsis, and then potential complications. So for wound care, I think just like anything else, we should get the basics right. And there's the four C's. There's cooling, there's cleaning, there's covering, and then there's comfort. For cooling, it can be as simple as cool tap water or saline poured over the burn. And the whole point of this is to prevent progression of burning and reducing pain for the patient. So don't forget this step. For the cleaning, most people use soap and water or some antibacterial wash, whatever you have available. I think there's still a lot of debate about the best treatment for blisters. I'll tell you in my practice, for the large blisters, I tend to debride those. And then for the smaller blisters or blisters involving the palms and soles, I tend to leave those alone for patient comfort only. That's the only reason I do that. I would basically do whatever the physicians or the burn center is asking you to do, but that's just kind of what I do in my clinical practice. The next part of wound care is the covering. And the simplest thing would be you just put a topical antibiotic ointment or cream and then some type of absorbent dressing over it. That's the simplified version. What you actually need are four layers of covering. There's the antimicrobial agent, which is going to be your bacitracin or your sylvidine. There's going to be some non-stick dressing, which is going to be your Vaseline gauze or something called Mepilex. There's going to be an absorbable layer, and then there's going to be something that holds those three layers together. It could be Curlex or Coban. I personally like Curlex because it has more give. Coban, I find, doesn't have as much give and can end up causing things like compartment syndrome. Now, many burn centers, this may not be a pre-hospital thing, but have moved to an extended or closed dressing designed to adhere to the wound. And so they help maintain a moist environment and they fall off when the wound is healed. And there's all kinds of versions of this out there. There's BioBrain, there's Suprathel, there's uh, Alloderm, there's Integra, and there's Matriderm. These are just some examples of some of those coverings. This may not be something that's available in the pre-hospital world, but it's just important to know that there are some burn centers that are doing this. And then the last C is comfort, and that's pain medications. So the first thing I'm gonna tell you about pain is that we should probably have some protocol that tries to objectively evaluate a, a patient's pain. And that should be protocolized and should be performed several times a day. Now, I recommend a multimodal approach these patients are gonna be super hard to get pain control on. And so I like to use all of these options in my armamentarium. Opioids obviously are gonna be the mainstay, but they're not gonna be the only thing that I use. Acetaminophen gets used regularly, NSAIDs get used regularly. Uh, gabapentin and pregabalin are things that are used in the hospital. They help a lot with neuropathic pain. Think about analgesic dose ketamine run as an infusion through an IV. Dexmedetomidine can also be an anxiolytic to help. Regional anesthesia, which may not be something you're able to do in the pre-hospital world, but is certainly something we're asking our anesthesia colleagues to help us with. And then uh, patient um, PCAs, um, where the patient can basically just click every time they need pain medication and there's no delays in their um, getting their pain meds. Longer term issues. So this is just a general rule of thumb. This is not 100% accurate, but hospital stays for severe burns can be weeks to months. And a general rule is for every one day is associated for every 1% total body surface area that is burned. So if you have an 80% burn, you're looking at 80 days. Now there's two major issues that come up. One is a hypermetabolic response and another one is sepsis and multi-organ dysfunction. So the hypermetabolic response Basically, the way this is treated is you want to really remove that burn tissue and cover the exposed area as soon as possible. And we covered that already. You want to minimize pain and distress because that can increase catecholamines. Many places are using propranolol to help reduce the hypermetabolic effects of catecholamines. And then, although maybe not a pre-hospital issue, these patients need nutritional support as soon as possible. So you'll see a lot of them with enteral feeding tubes and getting um, the calories that they need so that they don't get muscle wasting and they get good wound healing. 
Sepsis is going to be an issue um, because there's a huge risk because they just lost their primary barrier to microbial invasion. And this can develop at any point during resuscitation. Prophylactic antibiotics haven't been shown to be effective, um, at least in preventing infection, and they can cause more resistant organisms. So they're not typically just given prophylactically. And then the other issue is almost all patients who have severe burns are going to have elevated temps, they're going to have tachycardia, they're going to have white blood cell counts that are elevated. And so SIRS criteria are not really helpful in evaluating these patients. So they get a lot of frequent cultures and wound cultures to keep an eye out and uh, look for signs of sepsis other than just using SIRS. And then complications. So you can get extremity compartment syndrome, and these usually require escherotomies. The first symptom these patients will present with will be this subtle paresthesias. They can get uh, pain out of proportion. Of course, all the other pulselessness, pallor, those things are kind of late findings. Over resuscitation of these patients, which is why we spend so much time talking about fluid resuscitation, can cause lung injury and edema, can worsen ARDS and uh, acute lung injury. Under resuscitation, on the other hand, can cause acute kidney injury and multi-organ dysfunction. This is why we want to be as precise as possible in making these estimates and the amount of fluid we're giving these patients. And then something that shouldn't come up unless this is a late transfer is abdominal compartment syndrome. And the way this is usually figured out is with a Foley catheter that's got a pressure probe in it. Um, and these patients will start to get hypotensive and will have a very tense abdomen. And the treatment for that is typically an x lap. So burn management part three, don't forget about the four C's of wound care, cooling, cleaning, covering, and comfort. Get the basics right. Coverings that are done appropriately typically have four layers. This could vary a little bit depending on where you work. I think of it as an antimicrobial layer, a nonstick dressing like Vaseline gauze, an absorbable layer, and then something to hold everything together. Pain control can be difficult, so use a multimodal approach, whatever your protocols allow. Try and reduce that hypermetabolic state as best as possible. We want to try and remove any tissue that is burned and cover them well. We want to control pain. And then just know that you can also use propranolol to help. And then early feeding has been shown to improve outcomes in these patients. Infection can occur at any time. Prophylactic antibiotics are not helpful. SIRS is not helpful. So we want to have a low threshold here, but we don't want to overshoot and start giving antibiotics willy-nilly because we can cause bacterial resistance. And then be very aware for compartment syndromes in either extremities or the abdomen um, or even the thorax. And then pay very, very close attention to over and under resuscitation in your patients.